This is North Dakota Legislative Review on Prairie Public. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest is the Senate Majority Leader, Senator Rich Wardner of Dickinson. Senator, thanks for being here. Well, I enjoy always being here and visiting with you about legislative issues. Thank you. And we've got a lot of issues to talk about. I think one of the things that a lot of people are talking about is uh, Governor Burgum has now got some numbers and a budget. It's reduced from Dalrymple's budget. Can you, can you talk about uh, how that's rolling out? Well, I think that the legislature, and when I say the legislature, I'm talking about the appropriations. They're taking a real good look at that. He has some real good ideas in there. There may be some things that we don't uh, apply to that he, that he has brought forward. I know that uh, one of the issues that he would like to have had us institute, and that is a 5% uh, employee pay on their health insurance. And I don't, you know, at this time, I don't think we're going to do that because the state employees will get no raise. And we just feel that if we're going to do that, and we have no problem that at some point they need to probably pay part of their in health insurance, but they got to get a raise with it. I was thinking about that. You know, it used to be in the days of the 80s and 90s when their uh, state employees would go without raises that, that the legislature said, but you will have fully paid health insurance. And, you seem to be planning for that this year, too. Well, it's not any different in 2003. You know, they didn't get a raise then, but they got their health insurance. And uh, we said that uh, when times got better, we would uh, take care of them and increase their uh, raises, and we did. We had some 5% raises uh, in those good years, and uh, we, we took care of our state employees. And uh, as time goes on, when the time is right, we'll make sure that they're reimbursed and rewarded for the good work they do. And that may take a little while. It's just, it's just going to depend on how the budget rolls out over the next few years. That's right. And we think that uh, we're in a downturn. Not only do we have a, a low in uh, energy prices, uh, especially the oil is low, but we also have egg commodities are low. We just happen to have a time when they cycled in the low together. And I believe that it may take uh, three, four years, but we're going to come out of this and uh, we'll be in good shape. You know, Governor Brigham also talked a lot about reinventing government. And there are some initiatives out there. Senator Casper has a bill that he said is a kind of a vehicle bill to be used. You know, they could change it and do some hog housing amendments on it, if you want to put it that way. But it would be to... to uh, fold in the securities commissioner into the insurance department. And there's also the bill that's pending in the House about eliminating the treasurer's office entirely and having other agencies take over the duties. I'm kind of wondering where you're at in terms of reinventing government and, and maybe doing some of that consolidation. Well, first of all, I think that uh, Governor Burgum, when he talks about reinventing go uh, government, I think he's looking at du duplication. And we have a lot of agencies that do some of the same things and we need to decide what agency should be doing it and put it there and try to eliminate the duplications. Now getting to those offices, uh, we have to take a good look at it and make sure that all we're doing is moving the same number of employees into another office. Uh, probably no cost savings. Uh, you have to dig into that and find out whether uh, there really is. And so uh, as far as eliminating the treasurer, I know they only have a staff of eight people up there, and they do some important work. Believe me, Dave, if they send money out wrong, uh, they're going to hear about it. So those people have to be very precise and very exact on uh, sending money to political subs because that's one of their jobs. So no matter what, somebody's going to have to do that. Now, can we get some efficiencies? Maybe, but uh, we need to take a look at it. However, I want you to understand that if the state treasurer were to be eliminated, it would have to be put on the ballot by the legislature and the people would decide. Whereas the securities commissioner, the legislature could put them with the, either the insurance commissioner or maybe the banking commissioner and the mm -hmm. securities could be together. So there are some options you there, can take a look at yes. and see if there are actual savings to be had. Correct. One thing, one area that I'm hearing a lot about in looking at potential savings is higher education, especially what they call the back office things, um, old financial officers, that type of thing. 
that there could be some savings in that, and I, I assume your appropriations committee is really looking at that with a fine-tooth comb. Yes, they are, Dave, and I want you to know that uh, when you talk to legislators, they want those professors and teachers in the classrooms. They don't feel that that's where the cuts need to come. They feel that uh, in the administrative sector of the university is where that those cuts have to come. And there's, you believe that there probably are some reductions that could be we, made We there. believe that there are some there, that, and uh, that they can consolidate some of the jobs of some of these people that are vice presidents and administrators and chairman of certain areas so that uh, maybe one person could do the same job that two people are doing now. You know, it's interesting that this is getting a lot of attention, but I'm not really hearing a lot of panic, that this is not a time to panic. It's just a, it's a correction, perhaps. That's right. And I, wa I want you to know that uh, when the appropriations talks to the institutions, the institutions, the institutions have the ability to bring forward the programs that they think can be uh, combined. And uh, it's, it's not a dictatorial thing, but uh, they have input into their priorities. And they understand that the, that the state's budget is a little bit tighter. Yes, they do. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things have been talked about, about property tax reform. Uh, your Finance and Tax Committee had the bill this week in order for the state to take over fu full funding of county social service programs. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, I, I, I would like to see the state get out of the property tax business. I'd like to see us take it over. Uh, I know that others feel that uh, uh, it's not going to work out. But I, I, those are mills that you're going to take off the rolls. They're not, they can't be backfilled, as some people say. And uh, there is a plan there to transition out over a period of time. Because I want you to know that the 12% buy-down is more money than we need to take over the human ser or the county social services. So there's going to be some more money there that we would use to do a kind of a phase-out program over three or four bienniums. But in order, to, if you do that, then then the state can get out of the property tax relief business. They can, and of course, a lot of legislators are concerned. Uh, should the county social services combine? You know, we have some small counties. We have, uh, you know, programs that uh, can be combined in different counties. And so they would like to see some efficiencies. And they're afraid that uh, that isn't going to happen if the state takes it over. But, you know, uh, it's not going to happen now if the counties are in charge either. Let me go to another issue. And uh, it was brought up both in, I think, uh, Governor Dalrymple had it in his budget. I think Governor Burgum still has it in his budget proposals, and this this provider charge or provider tax on nursing homes. It's a f about five percent, if I'm correct. Well, uh, I think it might be a little more. Yeah, about five percent. I just want so that the, your viewers understand. North Dakota has a situation called equalization of rates. And it simply means that if you are on Medicaid you would pay the same for those that are private pay or private pay pays the same as those on Medicaid th that are in the same classification. So what happened when we did the allotment last summer, first of all, we took away the general fund dollars. Then along with that, those you have the matching federal dollars that go away because for every state dollar, there's a, a dollar of federal money. But what's, so that meant that the pay for those on Medicaid went down, which also meant that the private pay had to come down. So that's really a triple whammy. And so this proposal of a provider tax on nursing homes, it's really a provider tax or an excise tax on the private pays. They're the ones that would pay it. It would circumvent the equalization of rates because they would end up paying more because they'd pay the tax and get the money so the state would use that money to get federal match. That has not been very well received by the legislators. Neither the House nor the Senate is in favor of that. And so we're going to need approximately $20 million to take care of uh, nursing homes to get them back to where they were pre-allotment. 
20 million dollars. That's right. We have to find it in our budget. And so that's a priority. That is a priority. So I guess the idea is now, where do you look under rocks and, and you know, in desk drawers? How do you find the, bun the money? Well, I will just tell you that, yes, we, uh, uh, we took and downsized the Dalrymple uh, forecast about $170 million. So we've got our ongoing revenue stream at about $3.4 billion. That's $3,400 million. And so we'll start building from there. And we have transfers. We do have some money in some areas that we did not have back in 2003, Dave. Number one, we have more money that we can take from the Bank of North Dakota, $140 million approximately. That's a transfer. We have the Legacy Fund, which is the first biennium that we're able to use the uh, earnings from that. That's about $160 million. And we also have the Common Schools Trust Fund, which will put another $82 million in more. That was extra earnings this time into the K-12 funding. And we have the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, which was education. It was Measure 2 that the people released that. And there will be some money there that will help us. Those are transfers. There are others. I'm not going to go into any others, mm -hmm. but we will have those to help us plus the fact we have to make some cuts in the budget. And that's where the Burgum uh, budget cuts come. We will take a look at his ideas. We're going to use probably a lot of them and, uh, and, and some of our own to make sure that we come out of here with a balanced budget and an ending fund balance. Not to put too fine a point on it then, you're saying that the provider tax is probably not going to fly. Uh, no. It isn't, and we will find the $20 million. Okay. How do you keep all these numbers straight? Because there's a lot of, as I said, buckets of money here, there, and everywhere, and some have restrictions on them. Some, uh, you have legislative restrictions. For example, if you wanted to get into the, pr the principal of the legacy fund, and nobody's talking about the principal, which is over $4 billion now? You, you are right. It's, uh, it's $4 billion and, uh, and growing. But you can take the interest. We, but we can use the interest. And we're, no, nobody's interested in taking the principal at this time. No. But there are some things that you can do and move some money around. And, and it's, all, it's all, all well and good because it, you can do this. That's right. And well, another place, we're going to have some money in what we call our SIF fund, our Strategic Investment and Improvement Fund. Uh, you know, oil has a little bit higher price than we anticipated. Uh, it's, it's averaging North Dakota price. Now we're averaging around $45 a barrel. Uh, you know, nine months ago, we didn't think we were going to get 45. We were average, thinking 36. So uh, the price of oil is a little higher than anticipated. And so we are ending up with a little more money in that particular bucket or fund so that it can help us move forward. And of course, at $45, you've got a little bit of you know, activity out in, out in the oil patch, but it, if it would go to $60 a barrel, then you're starting talking about drilling again, and then the spigots start opening for sales tax. You are absolutely correct. That, they are tied that way because the minute they start drilling and they start fracking more, we do have a lot of wells that still have to be right, right, uh, yeah. fracked out there, and that's where it takes, uh, they buy material and that sales tax on that. And so if it the price of oil went to 60. It would uh, change the economic activity out there. And you're right, the sales tax would go up. And that's been the big driver of our general fund because it's dropped from, it was almost, it was almost at 3 billion and it's dropped down to about 1.7. Uh, that's, a, that's a big drop from what we were used to. It is a big drop, but it goes back to numbers of 2007, 2009. So it's you know, as um, the tax commissioner, Ryan Rauschenberger, said to me, it's going back to a new normal, but a, a new normal that we've seen before. That is correct. It, it, yeah, that's right. It's still good, but uh, we were used to, uh, I guess, used to uh, using it on other things. And I would like to make sure that the, your viewers know one of the areas that we did, we took over 115 mills of property tax and education with that 
extra sales tax money. And that right now uh, comes out to about uh, $750 million that is in the general fund that we are not going to go back on. We're not cutting that. We're going to continue to, to fund that. Every time I'm, you mention schools, I always think about what happened in 1982, 81, 82, when oil went down. This is right after Measure 6 got passed. Oil went down and schools had to be cut $45 million in the second year of a biennium. And Governor Olson at the time had no choice. He had to do that because that, that's the allotment process. And uh, in 1983, the Democrats took over the State House of Representatives. So th there's some history here. Well, that's right. Back then, they hadn't, uh, oil hadn't been around long enough. Number one, they did not have a, a rainy day fund for right. the general fund. And they didn't have this foundation aid stabilization fund. As you know, this time, when we did the allotment for everybody else, K through 12 was not cut. We got $116 million out of the uh, foundation aid stabilization fund for education and stuck it in and they remained whole. Do you think that that's not well known that the legislature saw, you know, in the, in the late uh, 2000s that oil was going to be good, but they needed to protect some of the money for these kind of situations? Absolutely, because I can tell you, before I got into legislature, I was at Dickinson High School, I saw people get cut because they did allotments during two biennium there, and the legislature said, we're not going to let this happen again. And it was in about 1995 session that they put this Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund into place. Now, it didn't gather much money because there wasn't much to gather f until about 2006. In the, I wanted to uh, switch gears here because you've been involved and the leadership has been involved in a bill that would actually that actually ended up slowing down uh, the implementation of the medical marijuana initiative that was passed by voters back in November. Reason being is the health department needed time to write some rules, and I understand that's going through. And I understand that you have the bill with the rules in it now. That is correct. I got the bill today from Legislative Council. It has been reviewed and tweaked by Legislative Council. The AG's office had to review it. The Health Department had to review it. And so tomorrow morning at 8.30 up at the Capitol, it'll go to delayed bills. Now, we couldn't get it in in the deadline because we needed to go over the uh, material in the bill to make sure that we have it right. We don't want to be making a lot of amendments. And so it'll be... Uh, in the delayed bills process tomorrow, and uh, it's an important bill. It will be accepted, and either Friday afternoon or Monday morning, it will be officially dropped in the hopper and be a part of the process. Are you going to try to fast track that in terms of hearings and getting on on the floor? Uh, n no, uh, we'll it'll be the regular time span. Uh, it is a big bill. The committee now will review it. You know, the AG reviewed it, and the Health Department reviewed it. Now we'll have the, it'll be in the Senate uh, Human Services Committee. They'll review it. And if we pass it out, which we will, uh, then it goes over to the House and they will go through it and they will look for things that probably should be corrected. But I want you to understand, Dave, and all your viewers, we're going to make sure that North Dakota voters get what they ask for, and that is medical marijuana, not recreational marijuana. And so, they're not going to get anything more or anything less, but they're going to get a good quality product, medical marijuana. So they'll get what they voted for is what you're saying. That is correct. And, and it takes time then after the bill is passed for the health department to get everything in place. And so that's why we had a bill before that delayed the implementation of it until July 31 of 17. But by then, the health department will have their people in place. They've got to be able to regulate it and administer it. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have a quality product. We do not have anybody in the state that can test the product to make sure the people are getting what they're supposed to get. Will there be testing after the bill passes? Uh, you mean... Uh, uh, testing in state or will it have to go out of state? No, we'll have, we'll have a provider in state to test it. Just like we have somebody, the health department checks on uh, food products to make sure that the public is getting 
good quality, well, we're going to make sure that the uh, those people that are uh, in a position and are patients and need medical marijuana will get a good quality product. And let's again uh, repeat that it's going to be medical marijuana, what the voters asked for, because there's Social media nowadays is full of stuff that, oh, the legislature is just, just delaying it because they want to kill it. They want to make the rules so onerous that we can't do it. That's not your intent. No, not at all. They will have access to it. Uh, I just want you to know that people from all over the nation have been calling here and want, bugging the state health department, uh, wanting to be able to grow it here, get permission to grow it, get a license. Well, they're not ready. They're not set up. And uh, so... The, the health department's done a good job of, of uh, thinking this through and providing a, uh, a process that will be safe for the citizens of North Dakota. Will the health department have to add more people? They will probably have to have some more people, yes. So another budget situation that, again, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle That's trying right. to get all this together. Yeah, we might cut some people from some other department, the health department, and move them over there too. So. We'll take a look at it and see how we can do it. You know, in the few minutes we have left, there, there are a couple other things I just wanted to ask you about. There seems to be a, a renewed interest in some kind of campaign finance reform. Uh, Senator Casper from Fargo has a bill in terms of, you know, more transparency. And there's another senator, Senator from Stanley, who's talking about initiated and referred measures that they want to limit the amount of out-of-state money that comes in for initiative and referred measures. Do you get the same sense I do that there seems to be more of an appetite for some campaign finance tweaking? Correct, and I think that uh, most of us as legislators know that uh, we better make sure we have some safeguards or we might get a initiated measure that will put ethics and campaign reform on us, the things that we probably will have a hard time living with. One of the things in the in the campaign reform bill is that it, tells people, it's transparent, we're legislators, how they spend their campaign money. Because a lot of people feel that uh, they want to know, how are you spending it? So they'll not only know where it's coming from, but they'll find out where it's going. And so that's what that bill does. And when an initiated measure, I think one of the things with the some of these uh, initiated measures that are driven by people from outside of the state, people are saying, hold it. You know, we're, we're, we've got a, a process here that's easy for the people to access. But we need to take a good look at uh, people from outside of the state influencing that and probably uh, causing uh, us to end up with some things we don't want through the initiated measure process. Is there going to be a possibility to set up an ethics commission? I don't think so. Okay. But the, the idea is that with these bills, you want to, again, just reinforce the trust that people in North Dakota have in the legislative branch. That's right. We want to be as transparent. That, you know, we'd like to think that we're ethical. We, 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 don't, we don't know if that that's necessary. I know some think that we've got to have that. Uh, but I'm telling you, uh, I know in, in our caucus we talk a lot about it. You, whatever, if you do something, it shows up as like the whole caucus is guilty. So everybody needs to, you know, be very careful and uh, be ethical in what they do and uh, treat people right. It's no different than when I was coaching, Dave. When, uh, when a player did something wrong on the floor, the whole team was tarnished with that sin. Now there's been talk about uh, having to to uh, keep some days in reserve. I mean, the, your counterpart in the House has talked about a 70-day session, keeping 10 days in reserve because there is some question about medical, uh, uh, the Medicaid and Medicaid reimbursement and the Affordable Care Act and what's going on. Do you need to keep 10 days in reserve, do you think? Well, I, I think we're going to sure shoot for it. I agree with uh, Representative Carlson that we need to try to be done around 70 days. Now, whether we can get it accomplished or not, I don't know. But our bill load is down. And so if they can hear some Senate bills before a crossover and we can process some House bills before a crossover, uh, that'll help us get there. But remember, it's the appropriations that's the yeah. main one. 
But that's kind of rare, though, that, that, that they might be able to get bills in the other house before a crossover. That's fairly rare, isn't it? Well, no, we, we, we sometimes, we hear bills ahead of time. We do, may not get them on the floor, but we get them out of committee. Okay. So with less bills, there's still a lot of work because this is a real nuts and bolts budget session. It is. It is. And, and really, the heavy lifting is the appropriations in both the House and the Senate. All right. Senator, well, thank you very much for taking the time today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time. Our guest today on Legislative Review, Senator, uh, Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner from Dickinson. He's a Republican, and he has been the Senate Majority Leader for three sessions? Three sessions. Three sessions. For Legislative Review on Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson.